Okay, so we are currently doing bridges earthquakes. Um, one thing that uh, I want to emphasize is you guys need to do this with linked lists. Um, this was previously a um, CSI 40 assignment. And in CSI 40, they did it by sorting the vector. I don't want you guys to sort the vector. I want you guys to do everything using linked lists, static link, uh, singly linked lists. So <clears throat> this code here is going to build a linked list. Um, starts off with head equal to null, and then it uh, iterates through all the different earthquakes uh, from the USGS data source. Um, this news a new uh, node and sets the next on it to be the head and then moves the head up. And so you start with a blank head. Um, the first time you insert something, it's next is null. So hey, it's the end of the list. And then the head becomes the new guy. And then when you insert a new guy, on top of the new guy, uh, the, the new new guy's next is the old new guy and the head moves up to the new guy. So this is a very compact way of building a linked list. Like um, as, as, as hard as linked lists are to kind of wrap your mind around, like you can see the code for like generating a linked list is actually, you know, not, it's not long. Right, it can be hard to wrap your mind around. And again, I would this is correct code. And so what I would do is I would study it and like maybe get out a piece of paper and just like sketch out what's happening. And if you can't sketch it out, then see Muya, you know, or, or, or talk to me. I have I have off stars every day. I was answering questions all uh, from eleven o'clock on. Um, uh, I'm trying to get magnitude. And it's giving me error that the method doesn't exist. Um, what is the name of the linked list? There's no name. <laughs> The uh, they didn't they didn't even make a list class right because you don't you don't need a list class I think the Zybooks talks about that where you can have a list class and the list class maintains things like a head pointer and the tail pointer and the size and all that kind of stuff uh, this one just has a single pointer and, and a node every node in a linked list is a linked list it is a recursive data structure and so that's why programming languages like Lisp um, the the basic data structure in it is a list because every node of a list is a list itself, it, right? And so a list of five elements is a list, and a list of four elements is a list, and a list of one elements is a list. And so it's, it, every list has a data thing, like in this case, a earthquake data, and it has a pointer to another list. That's all a list is. A list is a data structure which holds a single data point and has a pointer to another one of the same type. So um, there's no list class, there's just a head. That's it. So, are you blinking out on me? So I'm trying to sort of think it had a name and just passed the rules, but it didn't work. Yeah, all there is is head. And so what you need to do is you need to demonstrate to me that um, you can sort a linked list. Okay. So uh, in CSI 40, the way I told them to do this was to copy this into a vector and then to sort the vector and then copy it back into a linked list or something like that. Now you can't do that. I'm going to be going through your code and I'm going to be um, looking to see that you were able to sort a linked list. Um, I believe uh, Emma was asking if you could do insertion sort and um, yeah, the, the, um, uh, the, the, don't, don't worry about efficiency, right? So what, what I would do is I would search through the, I would search through the linked list for the biggest element or the smallest element, whichever way you're gonna sort it, create a new node, right? Just duplicate the linked list. And and so once you um, have pulled that guy out, then I would mark it as being deleted somehow. And then just keep pulling the biggest element out over and over again, or delete it out of the, delete it out of the old list, insert it into a new list. And so this will demonstrate to me that you guys know how to link list properly. And then once you've done that, then I can put up the next competency exam, which will be on linked lists. In order to get the take three on the competence exams, uh, Mulya, have you done the uh, the review yet for the classes thing? You did it using vectors. Yeah, you can you can do it that way to like uh, see if you, you get your code to work, but. You need, you need to you need to be able to sort a linked list using using pointers. This is a if coordinate with the TC. Okay, so whenever that happens, then the uh, the take three will go up. Uh, Mui will have the password for the third third take. 
It's like legit, we both need to talk to the TC. Okay, yeah, just uh, hang out after class and I'll, I'll set up with you. Or no, you have, you have PC right after class. Huh? No, whatever, just message me or something. Okay, um, you don't? You free after? Okay, no, let, let's set up then. Okay, so, um, no. this is code that will delete the linked list. And um, yeah, so you can see this is all very minimal. It's only like three lines of code, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is, I, I'm not minimizing the difficulty linked list. They're typically the hardest thing that students have trouble wrapping their minds around. But um, it, it shouldn't be too verbose. Okay. And one of the nice things about bridges is that it'll actually visualize your linked list for you. So if you screw up, you can actually look at it and be like, ah, yeah, I messed up. It'll, it'll view it. And uh, in order to test your code, one one thing that one thing I, I do want to mention is that the students, um, like in 45 right now, I, I've got some students that are having trouble like figuring out why their code's not working. And so they've got this big assignment. It's got this 2D array, and they're trying to access it in, in assembly and grab adjacent data in, in assembly and stuff like that. And it's just like, all right, just start with like, don't start with this big 500 by 500 array. Just make a three by three array, right? Just make a new file that's three by three, the values you know, and every time you read a value, print it, right? You, you, this is a skill that, that I almost, I'm almost doing a disservice to you guys by giving you guys input files because you just run the input tester and then it, you know, and then that handles the, the testing for you. But what you need to do, if your code's not working, you need to be able to drill down and, and find out why, right? And so I would I would actually like while you're testing this, I just like set it to ten, you know, set it to five, you know what I mean? And then just print the, you know, when the thing comes out of the when the thing comes out of the vector, just uh, just print just print it, you know, five, and then turn it into a linked list, and then after you sort the linked list, print the linked list sorted, and five is easy. It's big enough that it'll find any logic bugs. Don't use one. And two, those aren't big enough, but five is probably big enough to catch any logic bugs you have and then print it and just see if it's sorting the way, the way that you thought it would. And this is, this is a strategy that, um, is useful. If, even if you're not a computer science major, right? Like even if you're not a computer science major, it's like being able to break down a problem into a really small slice and see if that slice is working. And then once you got that piece working, test a bigger one and, um, and being able to isolate where where problems are is a really really useful skill and, and and students that struggle in computer science usually don't struggle on the programming side of things they struggle on the debugging side of things right and and that's normal right and so developing your skills at being able to home in on where the problem is is, is a really good is a really good skill for you guys to develop and, and again me giving you input files is almost a disservice because it, you don't have to learn how to test your own code in a lot of cases that's why we did the g-test thing a while back so it's, it's a good habit to get into to exercise your own code and find out where the problems are. Should we make a completely new list that is sorted? That's what I would do. I mean, it's, it's the easiest way. It's just make a new list and just pull out the biggest one every time. You know, from the old one, you, you would have to learn how to delete a list or not, or you just copy it out and just mark it as being pulled out. And either way, it doesn't really matter. But I'll just make a new list. I'll just duplicate the list and pull the biggest out every time. And um, yeah, and then just use that list instead of this list. Sure. Okay. Um, so that's rigid. That's uh, due on Wednesday. Um, uh, you you will be deleting from a singly linked list. It is not a doubly linked list, so there is no previous pointer. There is no tail pointer. This is a simple linked list. Okay. So if you're going to delete from a singly linked list. I'll just, I'll, I'll draw it out for you visually. Because this is really what the whole homework assignment is. That, you know, this part is pretty easy. Um, so, um, you, are, you are supposed to look at the documentation and use the documentation to, to do this kind of stuff. But basically, yeah. Um, for the, for the uh, sizes, they're just whole numbers, right? So just use the whole number. You don't have to um, worry about 1.1 versus 1.2. It's just a, a one earthquake. 
and then you saw probably from my code last time that I just wrote a function that looked to see if the end of the string was the same as Hawaii or Alaska, and uh, and so that was how I did the uh, the shape part of it. Was I just wrote a function that took two strings in and compared the end of them to see if the end of them was the same, Alaska, Hawaii, whatever. So that part shouldn't be too bad. Um, really, really, what I the the reason why I gave this to you guys was because I want you to a get experience with bridges because the next one's gonna be using bridges too, and b uh, continuing your experience with linked lists, having in this case creating a new one, deleting an old one, kind of at the same time. Can you do quick sort on lists? The sort, the standard sort, sort routine will not work on a, on the list. That's why in the uh, the standard, the list class has list dot sort because the standard sort function does not work on lists because uh, the sort function requires random access and there is no random access in the list. You have to run forwards or run backwards. With the to do change all these, we change the set size and everything else. There is should set size because the number of earthquakes in the list isn't random. Change the set size, set size, set size. Uh, it is for the size. Yeah, don't don't leave it as random. Um, for the size, you base the size on the the uh, magnitude of the earthquake. Right? Is that correct? If I'm remembering the homework right. So this is how you get the magnitude. So you get the location. Delete those so you don't fail the input test group. Um, but yeah, just look at the uh, splice. Splice does not exist for this. You might, yeah. You know. This isn't the standard library. This is just a boring linked list. <clears throat> Super basic. Okay, so let's go into OneNote. and we'll make a new page called 3121. Welcome to March, everyone. So a singly linked list is a linked list that just looks like this. Okay. And so we might have like, a, it's a 7.1 earthquake out of Alaska, and it will have a next pointer, and the next pointer is pointing at the memory address, the start of memory. All of these, all of these things take up a certain chunk of memory, and the pointer is always pointing to the very beginning of the chunk of memory. And this one might be a 6.1 out of Hawaii. Hawaii, that's a really big eye and a small eye. And there's a apostrophe in there too. Uh, and then its next is pointing you know, here as well. Okay. <clears throat> so if you were to delete, let's say you wanted to delete uh, the Hawaii one. Okay. Um, how would you do that? If you wanted to delete this in a singly linked list, it's actually harder. The singly linked lists are less code, you know, because it's one pointer instead of two, and um, it seems easier. But but the reality of the situation is like you need if you were if you were to delete this, if you were to delete this node, which pointer do we need to fix? Yeah, Alaska's now got a dangling pointer. If we deleted that memory, then Alaska's pointer is invalid. But if we were already here, like if we, yeah. If we were, already, if, if we had some sort of like temporary pointer or something like that, that was here. Then we don't have access to the the parent, you know what I mean. And so as you go down the linked list, there's a couple different ways you can do that. You could keep what's called a previous pointer, and so you have a temporary pointer and a previous pointer, and they're kind of going down the list together with a previous pointer always equal to the previous one from temp, because you don't have a backwards pointer, right? That doesn't exist. And so in order to sort of simulate that, as you are kind of for looping down the, it's doing this bug again.
as you're kind of forward looping down the way, you keep the previous pointer. Alternatively, what you can do is, um, as you're iterating down the, the list, you know, you check who the, who the next guy is. And if the next guy matches, you know, Hawaii or whatever, then you delete it and set your current guy equal to the, the, the next guy's next. Okay. So it's, I don't know if I want to give you that code because that's basically the homework assignment. So I'll, I'll let you guys figure that out. You're going to delete, delete this one and set Alaska's next to be the next one. That's, that's your homework assignment. That's how you sort. So for, for sorting, for sorting a linked list, you just go through the whole thing. Oh, this one's a 10.0. All right. Delete that out, you know, and put it into a new linked list and just do that over and over again. And, um, until the until the list is empty, and then you've got a sort of delete list. Okay, so that is your homework. Um, let's let's talk about stacks a little bit more. Stacks and queues are, are just like the basic building blocks of computer science. Um, we usually just use a, a real data structure instead, um, but it's still important to know it because the term stack comes up everywhere. They're used everywhere. Um, queues are used everywhere. Uh, even in reality, we use a vector, you know, whatever, instead of a stack. So uh, it's like a stack of plates, right? So if you... Uh, if you push one, push two, push three, when you pop, three comes off. In a queue, if you pushed one, push two, push three, one would come off, right? That's the difference between a stack and a queue. The stack, the last one in is the first one out. On a queue, the first one in is the first one out. FIFO, right? FIFO versus LIFO. First one in is first one out, that's a queue. Last one in, first one out is a stack. It's a terrible one. You guys understand? So if we pop, three comes off, we push, four comes on, stack is now four, two, one, we pop, four comes off, pop, two comes off, pop, one comes off, pop again, and we seg fault, if we're the standard library. You pop off an empty stack in the standard library, it's seg faults, which is fantastic design. <laughs> it's, not our, it's not our responsibility, it's your responsibility. Uh, yeah, it, it's a, you know, it, it's a good design decision, I guess, for speed reasons, but, uh, I will not write code that crashes. It's just my own personal thing. Okay. So, uh, what kinds of uses are there for the stack? Um, so the stack in computer science is implemented as a stack. It's a, it's co what's called a downward growing, uh, stack. So, um, if you've talked about the memory map before, you've got your code segment down here. That's where your program lives. Memory address zero, minefield of doom. Above the code segment is the data segment. There's also some other segments in there that don't matter right now. The data segment grows up. Every time you do a new, the data segment grows up. You got the stack up at the top of memory here. And the stack grows downwards. And so all of your local variables, anything nude is on the data segment. Anything from stack int, you know, x, Y, Z, all these guys are on the stack. And every time you do a function call, the stack pointer goes down. Do another function call, the stack pointer grows down. You return, the stack pointer goes back up. You return, the stack pointer goes up. It's called a decreasing stack, All right, It's a stack that grows downwards instead of upwards. Yep. Uh, reversing a word. So you can push letters onto a stack. For example, if you uh, uh, have A, P, P, L, E, and you push A, and you push P, then you push P, then you push L, then you push E. When you pop them, you get E, you pop L, pop P, pop P, pop A. So you end up getting E, la, ba. Okay. So reversing a word is classically done using a stack, even though in reality we just call the, the reverse standard library call, right? There's no need to, no need to use a stack. Just call reverse or a for loop, you know, it works as well. So, 
This is a very common uh, job interview question. So do you guys know what a palindrome is? Know what a palindrome is? What is a palindrome? A man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Yeah. Taco Cat. Yeah, it's my favorite. One, two, two, one. Sure. The palindrome is a weapon for. Is that destiny? Yeah. It's funny. Draw, oh coward. Oh, that's nice. It's a, that's a nice palindrome. Draw, oh coward. Race car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, there are a number of, um, there's a number of classic job interview questions that you will get in computer science and reversing a linked list is one of them. So like kind of what you guys are doing right now with sorting a linked list, uh, same thing, except you just take the bottom element, you delete the bottom element off, put it at the top of the, another one, repeat over and over again. So reversing linked list is a very common job interview question. Um, palindrome detection, fizz buzz, all these things. Like the reason I, it's not an accident that I'm giving to you. It's, it's so that you guys do well on the tests. You know, like you miss destiny. Race car. So how would we do palindrome detection using a stack? Yeah. Stack.cc. Oh, I already got one. All right, cool. Uh, let's make this a vector of chars, because why not? So, uh, string s is equal to read, please enter a possible palindrome. Okay. Uh, people are talking about destiny right now because of the palindrome weapon, for those of you at home. All right, so string s equals read, so we're going to do that. And then uh, we are going to say for every character in the string. Are you guys comfortable with this by now? Like, for every character in the string, we're going to say stack uh, dot push. We're going to push that character. So that's going to push all of the characters onto the stack. And then... Uh, how do we want to do this? We can make a new string. Yeah, that would work. String s2 uh, while stack dot size. So while there are elements still on the stack, we will call top and pop over and over again. Charc equals stack dot top. So that's going to get. So we're going to push a onto the stack. P P L E. And the first time this thing gets called, it's going to pop the e off, and we're going to push. We're going to get that off the top of the stack, stack dot pop, top and pop, get the top letter, pop it. And then we are going to push that into, we'll just add it to the end of uh, the new one. So it's gonna put E at the beginning of the new string and it's gonna keep doing this over and over again until the uh, stack is empty. And then we can say if S is equal to S2, using the overloaded comparison operator for strings, if all the characters are the same, then see out s is
I find I find that like when I'm using variables, that actually lets me know what my variable name should be. So rather than a st, I'm just gonna call it stack. Uh, like when I use variables, that that reveals their true name. Stack on top. Please enter a possible palindrome. Pool. Pool is not a palindrome. What about race? Race car. Race car is a palindrome. Cool. What about taco cat? Do you guys think that is a palindrome? Yes or no? Draw, oh coward. What do you think? Is taco cat a palindrome? You guys are all saying no. You have no faith in Taco Cat, huh? You're right. It's not a palindrome because it is case sensitive. It is case sensitive. We did this lowercase, Taco Cat, then it is a palindrome. So the ability to spit out a solution for that is needed on a job interview, programming job interview. If you're going to be doing this for realsies, you wouldn't write your own stack class. Why would you? You would hashtag include stack. And you would make a lowercase stack. Ooh, ah, mm, mm, let's not call this stack anymore then. Uh, 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 all right, go back to being ST again. <laughs> don't, don't make a variable on the, the same name as the type. That's just asking for punishment. Okay. A man, a plan, a can. Panama is a palindrome. Hello is not a palindrome. So if, if you notice, um, my stack class and the STL stack class work exactly the same way. And that was by design. I just made mine work the same way. So this is how you do it using the standard library. So on a job interview, if they asked you to do palindrome detection using a stack, you do it this way. There's lots of other ways of doing palindrome detection. You do a for loop where you Go, th go through the, the string. Um, yeah, there's at least four or five really obvious, easy ways of doing it. You can reverse the string, compare the reversal against the original. There's lots of ways of doing it. Uh, will the capital T cause it not to be? That is correct. Yeah, the cap it, it is case sensitive. So if you wanted, you could two operate. Uh, double equals operator compares all elements. Yes, for the, uh, and now that you've taken CSI 41, at least partly, uh, this will become uh, clear what's actually happening here. So the reason why I went over operators in C++ is because, well, guess what? The string library, the string class has a equals operator defined which will allow you to copy one string to another. It's got the at operator defined, which allows you to pull letters out. It's got begin and end, which allow you to do all those cool ranges based things like reverse and things like that. Plus equals operator that will add a character to the end of it. And it's got these operators, double equals, not equals, less than or equals, greater than, greater than equals, less than or equals. And then spaceship operator, which is new in C++ 20. Spaceship operator replaces all of these. So spaceship operator, because uh, before what you had to do, if, if you had like your complex uh, class or whatever, you'd have to implement a less than operator and a greater than operator and a not equals and an equals and a less than equals and a greater than equals. And it was really, really tedious and annoying. And so now they have what's called the uh, spaceship operator because it looks like a TIE fighter, but they couldn't call it that for copyright reasons. So all you do is, is implement this one here, and uh, and then it will generate the six for you essentially. Output and input operators. All right. So now that you understand, like all the string classes is just a class they've defined some operators on. There's nothing natural about it. Okay. Can you show how to implement an operator, uh, spaceship operator? Yeah. Um, 
it, it's a little bit different than what you'd expect. All of these return booleans, right? True or false, is it greater than, is it less than? The, the spaceship operator returns a special thing called a, where are you, where are you, where are you? There's a return type on it. It's just deducing it. It, it returns it returns a special uh, comparison type that will return um, whether it's less than, equal to, or greater than. That's odd that it doesn't have that return type in there. I wonder if it's deducing it. Huh. Okay. And so the way that it was designed is it's designed to work like the stir comp function. So there, there used to be a function, or there still is technically, called stir comparison. And all right, fine. C plus plus dot com. And so basically, it, it doesn't return true or false. What it does, it returns zero if they're equal. It returns less than or zero if the first one is lower, and it returns greater than or greater than zero. If the first one's bigger. And so there's three possibilities when you're comparing two strings, right? Apple and banana. Apple is less than banana. Um, apple could be equal to banana or it could be greater than banana. And so this is kind of how the spaceship operator works. Um, and it returns a special comparison type. We talk about that some other time, but uh, yeah, basically, I've got code in here somewhere that uses it. Yeah. Either way, it's not it's not our topic for today. Is the spaceship operator defined in the class with the other comparison operators or not? Yes, it will it will make the other ones for you. That's what's nice about it. So you only have to write one comparison operation rather than a, a bunch of them, right? That's brand new in C plus plus twenty, so. Um, what program did I use that in recently? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the lecture. Um, talked about parentheses balancing last time. So oftentimes when you're parsing like algebra, you'll push things onto the stack. As you're reading through it, when you get a closed parentheses, you pop things off the stack and process it backwards. Um, there's entire programming languages that are stack-based. So you push things onto the stack and pop things off the stack. Instead of having variables and things like that, everything goes onto the stack. And that's it for stacks. So, um, yeah. Do you guys get this? And conceptually, do you understand stacks and do you understand queues? That's really all that's really necessary. They're like major learning points for the semester, but they're actually, uh, it's kind of hard to say too much about them. You did the Zybooks on them, right? So. Your next Zybooks, by the way, is gonna be kind of a bonus Zybooks. I was thinking about not giving you guys any Zybooks this week um, because we're kind of caught up on it. So I, I, I decided to give you a bonus one it's not bonus, you still have to do it, but um, the first topic, Huffman encoding, is typically something I cover in the last part of this semester. Uh, and we haven't talked about binary search trees quite yet, so uh, th there's four sections on the Zybooks coming up. The first one does involve binary trees, so maybe I should just cover that. Hmm. And then the other three are, are conceptual, and you should be able to understand them pretty well. Make sure you guys do the Zybooks, by the way. It, they're they're uh, quite predictive of student success. So um, students that skip all the Zybooks tend to do very poorly. It could be correlations, not causation, all that stuff. But, um, I don't know. Understanding things helps. All right. So this uh, this homework assignment or this thing that I did right here. This is a very classic job interview question. 
And so you should be able to spit out something like that in short order. Um, I don't know if it's really worth a homework assignment because it's so basic. So let's talk a little bit about generic programming now. So I, I've been kind of I've been kind of leading up leading up to this leading up to this leading up to it leading up to it uh, for a while, kind of dancing around the issue a little bit. So like when we uh, Do you notice that it was kind of annoying for me to like have to change this from like a stack of strings to a stack of characters? It wasn't like super annoying, but it was like kind of annoying. All right. Do you, do you see what I did there? Like when I when I opened it up earlier in the lecture, this was a stack of strings, right? Because we had the the students going up a ladder for whatever reason. I don't know. It's kind of a strain metaphor for a stack, but um, or it was a stack of strings, and now it's a stack of characters. You guys remember that from like 20 minutes ago? All the way back then? Will we learn recursion in this class or is it future class? We kind of learned recursion in the last class. We kind of learned in this class. Kind of in CSI 26 too. Uh, I mean, like most linked list functions can be written recursively, right? Um, A little bit, a little bit off topic though. Um, and so if I, so if I, if I had a string of, like if I had a stack string, right? String stack and all these things were strings and stuff like that. And then like, it's kind of annoying, right? Like, I got this, and then, and then I want to, then it's like, all right, this thing came off. It's like, all right, now I need a character stack. All right, well. Y nine Y shift P and then I gotta copy and paste it and then come in here and make it char stack. Oh, but then now I need a now I need a stack of, of integers. Oh damn it! All right, Y nine Y shift P. Da, 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 da. Okay, now you're not gonna be a char stack. You're gonna be now an int stack and we're gonna go for s and and do for s and 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 this is fairly easy i guess to search and replace because it's only a couple lines of code you know most of our classes are bigger than that and and if you search and replace everything then you could actually screw up because you might be returning ints for like sizes and things like that and so when you search and replace for int now your size function is returning a string and it gets really kind of annoying. So there's gotta be a better way. And so there was a guy by the name of uh, Stepanov. He was a uh, Russian computer scientist, uh, Alexander Stepanov, I think his name is. And um, he was assigned the task of basically doing this, right? So like copying and pasting code and then like changing it so that it worked with a different type, right? So like, uh, let's make a function called absolute value, right? It takes in two integers, int a, int b, or let's see, just int a, I guess, you know? And then, you know, we could say like if, uh, uh, mm, yeah, sure, uh, int, right? So if, um, a is less than zero, return negative one times A. Otherwise, return A. Okay, so he was given the task of like, you know, copying and pasting functions and changing the types on them, right? Because in C, you can't even have the same name for a function. There's no, there's no function overloading. And so he had to do this. And so he had to have like a integer absolute value and a float absolute value and just copy and paste, double absolute value, char absolute value. Right, and then, okay, now that you finish that, 
Now that you finish that, let's do swap. You know, I'm just deleting because I don't care about them. Uh, let's do swap. You know, there's a uh, integer by reference A, integer by reference B. Okay, so say integer C is equal to A and integer C equals A. So integer B equals A and integer A equals B. No, that's not right. There we go. So B. Right. So uh, we. Yeah, no, 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 no. So C is equal to B. So that saves the value of B. And then nope, nope, nope. C. Thank you very much. Um, and so there you go. So we make a temporary variable that copies value of B. We set the value of B to be A, and then we set the value of A to be the original value of B. Cool. All right, we got swapped on one through five, six, y six, y shift paste. Now we get to do that again for floats. Yay! Yay floats. Oh, and then we got to change this in here. All right. Yeah, all right. Now we get to do it again for doubles. Now we get to do it. In, do you guys? start seeing why you know he realized there was a problem and there was a need for something better see what the problem is is this when auto was introduced nope auto was introduced 30 years later so um here, here's a here's another example of the problem let's say that we want to refactor the string class and we want to make it so that pop returns the value as well I've got to change it here, right? And then I've got to change it here. And then I've got to change it here. So every one of those, you know, 40 classes that I copied and pasted, if I find a bug in my code, I've now got to change it in all 40 of them, right? Instead of having one class that represents a stack, I've got to change it every time. If I if I find a bug like, like my original non a uh, coffee form of myself did uh, with a bug there. Uh, and I had copied and pasted a bunch of times already. Now I've got to go and maintain 40 different swap functions, right? And so what Stepanov said, you know, it'd be really nice is if I could just write one function. If I could just write one function that sort of it encapsulates the very notion of what it means to swap something without having any reference to the types at all. Right, because all these functions are doing the same thing, right? They're all doing the same thing. All that changes is the is the type. So what I would really love to be able to do is, is do this. Hmm. That's what I want to do. Okay. And uh, there was a conversation that took place in the early 80s, I think, with Bjarni uh, over adding this to C++. And it was added. There's some controversy over whether Bjarni saw the virtue of it immediately or not. He claims he did. Um, but I had questions about the implementation. So, uh, yeah. And so this is, no notice how uh, COC is not complaining about this. This is valid C++. And so a template is the keyword they came up with for doing fill in the blank types, right? So what this says is every time you see the word T and I'm going to, let me call this capital S swap because there's actually a swap in the standard library that, you know, maybe Stefanov wrote or one of his spiritual successors. So, T is like, uh, have you guys ever seen Mad Libs? Like, um, where like he's got himself promoted for his good ideas. Actually, the, 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 the idea came to him while he was, I think, in a Moscow hospital getting a stomach pump for like uh, fish. Like he, he ate bad fish or something like that. I don't, I don't remember the exact story. But he was like deathly sick and he was just sitting there like having one of those, so this is my life now moments or something like that. He's like, you know, there's got to be a better way than just having me copy and paste code over and over again. Um, Mad Libs. So, if you guys have ever, have you guys ever seen these? Uh, okay, that is not uh, safe for work. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Mad Libs for Kids. Yeah, okay, let's do that one instead of the Fifty Shades one. Okay, so uh, basically it's a blank, right? And so uh, so basically for Mad Libs, the, you, you write this template here, and then you write a template, and then somebody will come in and fill in the blank later, right? And so... Um, So that's what is going on here. So this this will actually not compile the code because it, it doesn't know what type it is. And so what it is, it's a fill in the blanks kind of thing. And so if you wanted to do a swap, you, you uh, need to specify what type it is, right? So if I have integer A equals 42, integer B equals five, 420, whatever. And I say swap. There is a fill in the blanks part there. Okay. Fill in the blanks. What is T? In this case, it's integers. So when you put that angle bracket, like you guys have been doing this whole time, vector of ints, stack of chars, stack of strings, the things that go within the angle brackets there is the type. And so the type goes in and it's a fill in the blanks thing. So I just said swap int. And so the T here turns into int. The T here turns into int, the T here turns into int, and then it generates code for you. And so if I did this, um, this actually, when the compiler sees this, it will actually generate a new function for you, plugging in int for it. And if I were to do this with float, float f1 is equal to 3.14, and f2 is equal to negative 0.0023, I could swap angle bracket float f1 and f2 and if I were to see these things out uh, a followed by b and see out f1 followed by f2 and I'll just return then you will see that 420 and 42 switched spots and negative 0.0023 and 3.14 switched spots. All right, 420 and 42 switch spots, negative 0.0023 and 3.14 switch spots. So what would happen if I put in int here? What would happen is, uh, it, <laughs> it's not, it's not going to like it is what's going to happen. Thank you, COC champ. Um, yeah. okay. So what if I deleted this entirely? In this, it, what will happen is C++ will try to deduce, will try to deduce what type should go in for T. Okay. So T's there, T's there. F1 is a float, F2 is a float. If I deleted this. F, uh, it's an int, it's an int. So this one will generate the integer version of swap. This one will generate the float version of swap. Okay. Code works exactly the same way. So in cases like this, cases like this, it can deduce the int without needing to type it. It's kind of cool. Right. However, for a stack, if I deleted that, it wouldn't know. It wouldn't know what kind of stack you want. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like, what kind of stack is it? You you got to tell me, dude. You're giving me nothing to work with here. You know. I wonder if this would work. Does that work? No. Nah. I don't think it's got a constructor for it. Yeah. So it need to be stack of chars. 
But if it can, it will deduce the type for you. So you don't have to specify them every time. This is sick and life changing. Yeah. Uh, looks like you've been recording a macro for the past couple of minutes. Uh, what do you mean? So, um, his template thing led to the standard template library for C and C++. Yeah, it was actually kind of interesting. It wasn't part of the standard. Um, after templates got introduced in uh, the 80s at some point, I think, uh, when were templates introduced to C++? They were, they were dicey for a while. They were dicey. Like, they... they um, the error messages you'd get from templates were like really bad, like really, really bad. Um, and you know, 40 years have gone by and they're still pretty bad. What were they added? Uh, I don't have a date on them. When was it begun? 1993. Okay. So, uh, 93, Alexander Stepanov. Okay, his name was Alexander. Uh, he presented a library based on generic programming to the S Committee for Standardization. The committee's response was overwhelmingly favorable and led to a request for a formal proposal in 94. Yeah, so, uh, da, 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 and it was incorporated in the ANSI draft standard, which was 98, right? So, uh, history of the standard template. 79 okay 79 he began working on generic programming and uh let's see what does it say yeah. uh, when was it included 87 maybe something like that yeah. yeah so yeah around then sounds about right to me uh so Templates used to be like causing a huge number of errors to appear on the screen, and nowadays they're still they're still not great. Um, oh, I, I, did I? Yeah, okay. Q W. Okay. Um, is Alexander a researcher? Like, how does one go about adding a library? Can anyone do it? Great question. So yeah, um, the the process of getting something included. In C++ is um, baroque and complicated, but um, I'm actually on the mailing list of uh, the people that when when you propose a new idea for inclusion in C++, either for the standard library or for the language itself, it goes to this mailing list, and so I get to see all the, I you know I, I don't contribute to it at all. I just watch it because it's just kind of interesting to me, see what kind of issues people are raising and stuff like that. And uh, sometimes they find like a bug in the language itself, right? Like this should work, it doesn't work. Um, or it works, or it's not clear how it should work. Um, but if you wanted to add a library to the standard library, like for example, my read library, I send an email to them proposing it. And then if the people like it, they will say, yeah, you should propose this to, uh, there's a whole process. There's different working groups. There's the evolution working group and the next generation star trek i don't know uh, there's like all these groups and you propose it to them and they take a look at it and they vote on it and then it moves to the next level and they vote on it then it goes to the next level and they have these meetings um around the world occasionally uh prague i think was the last one before coronavirus hit and then before that it was like kona and i think san diego had one um, and so they have these worldwide meetings and people fly in from all over and they talk about changes to the C++ language. So, do you have to do a thesis defense or peer review? There is a there is a, a paper process. It's the way that it works. So, um, so for example, let's say that you found a problem in the string class. Do you see down here? Defect reports. And so all these papers get a number. And they say, you know, like the, the paper to propose 
the Starship operator was something, 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 some number, right? And so you can click on that, and then uh, this is the LWG library working group, and then uh, it's not clear what happens if comparison category, that's like the Starship operator thing they were talking about, I think. Uh, string view comparison. So they propose changes to the standard additions, subtractions, and changes. And so you, basically what you do is you write a paper. You write a paper up and you submit it once you've kind of gone through the initial screening process. And then these papers get voted on and they get voted to either reject or modified or advance to the next category. And when it gets to the committee, which is at the top level, they vote to approve something or reject it. And they have conversations about what this will mean for the language going forward and all this kind of stuff. And if they approve it, then it gets wrapped up into the next ISO standard, um, which comes out every three years. It used to come out every seven years because they used to think that the st that ISO requires you to do a minimum of three years between standards, but it was actually a maximum of three years between standards. Apparently, they, they had their science backwards. And so that's why we've had C++ 11, 14, 17, 20. The next one will be 23. Because they, but before that, it was C++ like 03 or something like that. You know, so they'd gone many years without a standard. It went 98 to like 03 to like 11, something like that. So, uh, can you use non-template parameters in the template at the same time? Like, does this work? Sure. And so what that would do is, um, yeah, absolutely. So let's you know, just be like uh, int x, you know. Sure, why not? Yeah, basically, just T will substitute for um, T will substitute for whatever goes into the angle bracket there. Yep, and you can have multiple types in there if you want. Um, class T, class U. You do that if you want, and then you could call the function it's like swap and comma float like that. you'd like. You can have infinite number of parameters technically inside of the angle brackets if you want. If that's your thing. Well, one must really know C++. Uh, also must use math proof alike to prove in C++ inconsistencies. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it, to, to propose something, you, you probably should have a pretty good, decent working knowledge of C++. Uh, as the committee will tell you, though, like they don't know everything that's in C++. That's why it's a committee because there's different people that kind of specialize in different parts of the language. And, uh, and so you have to have a bunch of different people looking at it from different angles. And somebody's like, oh, that's going to break uh, this over here. And I was like, oh, really? Yeah, here, let me show you a case. And, oh, yeah, that is going to break it. Yeah, okay. Let's, yeah. And so the, the C++ standard is so large that nobody really knows the whole thing. Um, there's, some, there's some, you know, <clears throat> nerds. <laughs> I'm kidding, but, but really... Um, nerds out there that really get into the language and understanding all the edge cases of it and stuff like that. But you don't need to know that, honestly. So one uh, one uh, job interview question I like asking is, what percentage of the standard do you know? And if somebody's like, oh, I know the whole thing, it's like, no, you don't, Homer. Nobody does. Nerds. Yeah. It was a Simpsons reference. Uh, what is the right answer? I don't know. What percentage do you know? I don't know. <laughs> it's it's like the thing. The thing is that like the size of a small house, you know. So like, yeah, you stack it up end to end. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Ten percent maybe would be a good good answer. Somebody's like, I know ninety five percent of it. It's like, mm. yeah, you don't actually. Okay, so you can also do templates with a class. And so rather than having to do string stack and char stack and int stack and all that kind of stuff, all you need is one stack class. So if I was to templateify my stack class, what I would do is same thing, template. So that's the syntax here, template. Um, just like that. So template class T. And what that will do is it will give me a fill in the blank type that can have things substituted in for it later, like this. So stack of chars, stack of strings, stack of ints. And so whatever you specify in the angle brackets there gets passed in here as T. 
And so I want to have a vector of t's, and I want to push a t, and I want to top a t, and there we go. And so now that's, that stack class that I made will work with any type. So it's no longer holding chars, and it's no longer holding strings or whatever in particular. Now my stack class will work with literally any type, or almost any type. It should work with any type, but if, if the type is weird, then it might not work, because it's, it's going to try passing that type to vector, and if vector can't handle it, it'll, it'll barf. So what is a template, and what does that keyword mean? A template means uh, this class or this function has a type, and I don't know what it is, but I will find out later. That's what template means. So I am making a stack class, and I'm going to have a vector of something, and I'm going to be returning something when I call top, and I'm going to be pushing something when I get push called, but I don't know what that thing is. It might be an integer, it might be a string, it might be a float, a double, a char, I don't know what it is. I will find out later. And so you actually write your stack class like this, where just instead of int or float or whatever, you just write t. t is like that Mad Libs where you have a fill in the blank. And so later on when the person does this, let me call the class like that. When I do that, then everywhere inside of here that t appears, it will put the word char instead. It literally copies and pastes the code. It literally copies and pastes the code, does a control F, search for T. It, well, I mean, you know, not the letter T, like, you know, the symbol. You know, everywhere the, the symbol T appears, it will substitute in the word char. So it's, it's as if, like, when I do this code here, when I do this code here, um, It, it literally does this. Bloop. This is literally what the compiler does for me. You see that? So it copies and pastes that template, and then everywhere the word T appeared, the symbol T appeared, because they put char there, it substitutes in char, char, char. Okay. And... <clears throat> And so you can't, you cannot actually compile that code. That code won't compile because it's missing the type information. It will only compile after you pass it a type. You can't compile a Mad Lib, you know what I mean? But this code, all told, will compile because I'm instantiating a stack with the template parameter of char passed in. Um, there is a thing. You could use type name here as well. What is the difference between type name and class? Nothing. So. Either one of these two options will work. There's no difference. So um, it's kind of like struct and class, except there's literally no difference. Structs, everything's public. Class, everything's private by default. Um, type name and class are actually exactly the same. There's no, there's no difference at all. Why would you use one over the other? Well, uh, typically you will use class if you have a class type, right? Like if. If I'm going to be passing in, you know, some, you know, some class that I've made, oftentimes I'll use class. Whereas if I'm going to be passing in chars or ints or things like that, then I would tend to use type name. It, it doesn't, it, it really doesn't make any difference. It's just kind of a clue to a person reading the code what kind of thing you're expecting. I use type name if it's a primitive type, like a char, int, float, double, something like that. I use class if I'm expecting it to be a class, like a string, vector. Something like that.
type name makes more sense to you because everything's a type and everything's a class. Yeah, it's also more typing. So you know, there, that's the benefit of class. Also, it's less less letters, but it it, it, it literally makes no difference. So I don't I don't really care which one you, you use. Okay, so if I compile this, it's been a while since so I've compiled it, right? Run it. Um, taco cat works just fine. So you guys see the benefit of that? Like, you don't need to make nine million swap functions. You make one. You don't need to make nine million stack functions. You make one. And if you were to change something like where like pop would return the value as well, you only need to change it in one place, right? You don't have to copy and paste your change over and over again. Okay. Same big O runtime for everything. Yeah. So those are those are templates, and they're they're really useful. Um, the one thing you have to watch out for. Uh, Let's see. That if you're if you're doing like separate compilation, separate compilation doesn't work because you can't compile a template. So typically you don't do separate compilation with templates. You typically put them all into a header file and just include the header file. Um, but if you if you were to do it, you'd have to do something like this. You can't write void stack colon colon pop. This won't compile. You're, like, oh, you're looking at it, so it should compile, right? Mm. No, the, the weird thing is if you have a templated class, every member function must be templated as well, even if you don't use the type on it. Okay. Uh, void stack pop back pop. What are you complaining about? Uh, uh, stack. Yeah. Yeah, even if you don't use the, the type anywhere within the uh, the function, uh, you still need to do this every time. So that that's something that students always get sabotaged by. They they forget. They just write it like this, and then the thing doesn't compile, and they're like, I don't know why it's not compiling. Use of undeclared identifier back. Did you? Yeah. What? what does that mean? Yeah. So if you're doing this thing with like the double colons and all that stuff, uh, you have to. If, if you're uh, defining the functions outside of the class itself, you just have to put the template type name T onto every member function always. Do templates make it run faster too? Uh, no. And it doesn't help with compile times either. Compile time is probably a little bit slower with templates because it has to generate new code every time, right? So there's, there's ways of accelerating that. It's not... It's not something I'd really worry about. Um, it, it, the, the, the main benefit of it is that you don't have to have 20 copies of the same code, right? So it might speed up compilation that time, it, it, that way, because you don't have to have these giant files with every possible permutation of parameter, you know, just, you have it once. So, hmm. Yep, yeah, that's about all. That's about all there is to say about that. Templates are useful if you're if you're making a data structure. Um, they're typically templated. Uh, the bridges source code uh, locate bridges dot h pseudo update database. Do less lines of code help with the runtime? Oh yeah, remember the quiz from from today. Say you guys did on that. So I suspect not well. The mean professor. Give me his tricky quiz questions. <laughs> it's literally what I lectured on last time. Week seven, day three. Let's see what the quiz statistics are for this one. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, almost everybody gets um, this one right. So we talked about shallow copy versus deep copy. If you use the default copy constructor, it just copies all the pointers over. 
now the two lists are both pointed at the same elements, and if you delete from one, it deletes from the other. And so when one goes away and it calls the destructor and it wipes everything out, it wipes everything out from the other guy. And then when they go away, it double deletes everything and it, everything explodes. Right, so you want to do a deep copy instead, which means you go through the list and you duplicate each node in the list. Um, that's why you write your own copy constructor. Or if you're me, you just delete it. <laughs> so this one, yeah, 62% got this one right. So uh, this looks like an order in squared algorithm. So 21% said in squared, 17% uh, said in. It looks like an in squared algorithm. However, it is not. If the vector is of size one, it will run a thousand times a thousand a million times. If vector is size a million, it runs a million times. If vector is size a billion, it runs a million times. If vector is size a trillion, it runs a million times. It is constant running time. It does not change the running time of the algorithm based on the size of the vector. Now, to be fair, if it's smaller than a million, it'll crash because it's using dot add and it's going out of bounds. But uh, the point is, is that the, the the running time is constant. It does not matter how many elements you have in VEC. It will take 1 million operations no matter what. Okay. So, um, yeah, constant. That's what order one means. There, there's always an invisible constant on there, K, times one. And in this case, K is a million, right? Or two million maybe because it's doing a addition. It's doing an addition in an assignment. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the point is that it's constant running time. Order one means constant running time. Okay. It looks like n squared because it's a doubly nested list. It's not. The running time of this does not change if vector is bigger or smaller. No one picked login. Yeah. Nobody understands it. <laughs> oh, man, where is bridges? There it is. Okay. So here is the class that you're working with. So the singly list uh, element it is it is in squared, but n is constant in this case. If the if statement had LL or the for loop, does that change things? Uh, if it if it if it varied with um, the size of the vector, it would, right? So if if it was going from i equals zero to i is less than vector dot size, yeah, then it varies with the size of the vector. But if it's constant, then it's order one. So is there an O imaginary? Uh, yeah, probably not. There is order factorial. <laughs> So these are namespaces. We haven't really covered those yet, have we? Mm. So, hey, look, you guys can probably understand this now. So here is the singly linked element that you guys are doing for your, for the homework assignment. Okay, so uh, template type name E in this case. I don't know why, well, E for element, I guess. This is inheritance. You guys haven't learned inheritance yet. It doesn't really matter. Let's focus on this part. It is a single single list element. And it has a private, protected the same as private in this context. It's got a private element for next. It's default initialized to null pointer. It's a pointer to the same type. And uh, it's got a constructor. Look, you see how they use default values for the constructor as well. So if you don't pass them in, they will have default values. Cool. And it's using, look, list initialization. That's cool. So they list initialize the element to be you know, that and that. So that whatever the default values are, those get passed over by default. And then it calls set next on next. Not that next, this next. So they they, they name their parameters the same as uh, the Fresno State guys, I guess. Uh, all right, so uh, we got another constructor here. And then we've got some getters and setters, get next. Uh, one returns a const pointer, one that returns a non-const pointer. 
Don't worry about virtual. Um, set next. Gooders, setters, look, setter, set a pointer. Okay. Private section. It's got some stuff. None of this, none of this is exposed to you guys. So what's happening here is this is what causes these SL elements to render, right? So all this stuff here, get data structure representation, um, none of that, none of that is visible to y'all, right? All you need to know is that you can get a pointer and you can set a pointer and that's it, right? You can get the data, I think, on it as well. And that's about it. Okay. And then all this stuff is what actually gets sent over to the bridges server. So the bridges server will get past a chunk of data and then it'll render it for you based on that secret data that gets passed over. So, yep, this is a big class, right? But it's templated, look. That letter E appears all throughout the code. That's whatever type you pass in. For your homework, it's the USGS data, right? Okay. So that's what you guys learned today is used in you know, professional libraries all over the place. What are function name? All get elements. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, any questions about templates? Uh, you had some good questions earlier. Um, it's about all there is to it. You uh, you just do this, and then T will just kind of appear. Whatever you put in, and the brackets get substituted in here. When we create the second list we use for sorting, you could use that class. You, that is the SL element class, right? So that is that is what you're using already, that class that I just pulled up there. Without knowing it, because you don't need to know, because the interface, that's it's an ADT, right? Like there... There's an interface and then there's behind the scenes all this stuff going on that will cause the thing to be rendered properly and all this. Uh, you don't need to know about it. Just make a second head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, there's no other questions. Then uh, I'll set up the... Uh, Scott is typing. And I will set up the, uh, the review session with Muya for classes type three. Okay, good luck. Have fun on the homework summit. And uh, be sure to be here on Wednesday so you can get a partner for uh, the RPG summit. When is the link to this competence exam? Uh, uh, coming up soon. Maybe. Uh, We'll see. We'll see. All right. See you guys.